We take our Bibles and turn together to Galatians chapter 5 once more. As we've been studying through this passage, we took a a stock take, if you like, of the things that we've been thinking about so far in order that we might then progress. But verses 19 to 21 is where we've come to. And it is one of the lists of the Bible. And it is, in this case, a list of what Paul calls the works of the flesh, and there's some interesting things to notice here as we study this portion, and I want to speak to you tonight about the tragedy of a godless life, the tragedy of a godless life. Let us read verse 19, Galatians 5 to 21, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you again, told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What we have here is three things, a striking list, a repeated plea, and a tragic end. A striking list, that is, the Apostle Paul gives to us no less than 17 things in a row. That's a long list, even if it were a shopping list. It's a long list. 17 things, all listed one by one. And I think it would be helpful, though this isn't my primary objective in giving you this list, I think it would be helpful if I just explained through the meaning behind what Paul is saying, just so that we're all on the same page as to exactly and precisely what does he mean. Now, some of the words will be instantly understood. You'll read the word and you'll think, yeah, I know what that is. And others of the words, you'll think, I could have a stab at that. I've heard that before or I've looked that up before, but I can't quite remember. So let us just be clear as to what it is that the Apostle Paul says are the fruits and results of living governed by your flesh, governed by the physical or carnal part of you and neglecting the spiritual part of you, your soul. The first is uh, two things that uh, go together. There's adultery and fornication. Now, adultery is any kind of breaking of the marriage covenant, and fornication is despising marriage altogether because intimacy is given by God, as it says in Hebrews chapter 13, it says uh, that uh, the marriage bed is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So any kind of breaking of the covenant bond between a husband and a wife, or indeed despising that bond altogether and uh, seeking out intimacy outside of marriage, that is the first two. And they go hand together, hand in hand together. Because at the very beginning of creation, God said in Genesis chapter 2, you can't get much earlier than that. Any earlier than that, and man isn't quite made yet. So at the very beginning of God's revelation for how he constructs the world, he ordains that for this cause shall a man leave his father and a mother, and they shall be joined together, a husband and a wife, and they shall become one flesh. So to despise the marriage bond And to break it, to break the covenant, for marriage is a covenant vow, to break that bond with adultery, arises not from the spirit. It comes from the flesh. It comes by being governed only by the carnal. And fornication, which is uh, bounds everywhere in our society, which is uh, that kind of intimacy without that kind of commitment, is also 
it arises out of the carnal desires, the, the natural desires of the flesh. So we, it begins with a, a adultery and uncleanness. And we think to ourselves, wow, we're, we're off to quite a solemn start. But it doesn't get any better. It goes on to uh, uncleanness, and that is any sort of impurity or filthiness, uh, lasciviousness, uh, and in, it, it, uh, uncleanness and lasciviousness kind of go together in as much as impurity uh, that is within is the uncleanness and that is without in your words or in your deeds or filthiness we might say is a more descriptive word filthiness on the inside or filthiness on the outside you've got uncleanness that's filthiness on the inside lasciviousness that's filthy talk or filthy behavior on the outside Anything that is seedy, filthy, uh, impure, that is what is being spoken about. Now, again, the Holy Spirit won't inspire you to anything that is impure. Anything that is filthy or seedy or uh, distasteful or wrong. The Holy Spirit doesn't bring about those thoughts. The natural appetites and desires of the flesh do. And likewise... The Holy Spirit doesn't inspire you to, to speak words or do things that are filthy. Uh, the, 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 the flesh does. Uh, we go on, uh, lest we should take all, all night. I was reading to Caroline this afternoon. A uh, gentleman, uh, uh, a pastor, once announced that after the service there would be a board meeting, a brief board meeting, and they went to the back of the sanctuary and sort of, all the board gathered together and they realized that there was a stranger who had just turned up for the first time who had decided he was going to join them. So the pastor turned to him and said, excuse me, sir, um, this, is, this is a board meeting. And he said, yeah, that's right. He says, and after that sermon, I'm as bored as anyone. <laughs> so hopefully that won't be the case and I won't take too long with these, but it's important to understand them. Idolatry, I think, is the worship of images. We understand that. We're creating our own gods. There was a, a classroom of primary school children. And one little girl was hunched over her picture as they all took time to draw something. And uh, scribbling away. And uh, so the teacher went over to have a look and said, what are you drawing? And she said, I'm drawing God. And... Uh, the teacher said, obviously a Christian or had some knowledge, she said, but we don't know what God look, looks like. And she said, well, miss, you will in a minute. Because I'm drawing him. <laughs> People create their own God. Make some kind of idol, and then they pray to it. And every time they walk past it, they cross themselves, or they have some holy attachment to it, and they put them in their cars or in their gardens or in their windowsill. And they have man-made gods. We don't want the God that is the real God, the true God, the invisible God. We want something that we can see. And we want something that we can, we can kind of just shape a little bit to suit us. Because all this business about righteousness and holiness, we don't want anything to do with that. And... Uh, so people for all of time have made up their own God after their own imagination and then they have worshipped idols. So idolatry. Um, uh, witchcraft, that is all satanic forms of anything occultic, uh, black magic, astrology and so on. And then we come to a list that kind of belongs together that are all about the relationships that are sullied. Uh, so we've got uh, the marriage uh, and all sexual relationships that are sullied by the flesh. Then we've got religion that is, is sullied and destroyed by the flesh. And now we have other relationships and the ways in which people who are led by carnal appetites and desires end up ruining and spoiling the harmony and the peace of the relationships that they are in. And sin gets in. And the devil gets in. 
So we have the first one is hatred. That is the passionate reviling or contempt towards someone that leads you to hostility, hatred. Variance, literally to be different or at odds with someone, to be contentious, argumentative, quarrelsome. Emulations are uh, jealous feelings, the stirring up of resentment or indeed of bitterness towards someone. The, uh, uh, that's emulations, jealousy. Uh, wrath, literally, the Greek word is heat. Fits of outbursts or of anger. Strife, the root word is to provoke, to be out of fellowship, to have broken relationships, to be at odds. Seditions are plotting or scheming against someone out of malice or self-interest. Heresies uh, are parties and sects that come together according to beliefs that are false and unite together in some common cause. Uh, envyings, a uh, bit like jealousy, only instead of uh, being jealous of what someone else has got, and you'd like to have that, Envy is kind of worse, really, because you don't want them to have it. You want it yourself, but you don't want them to have it. And there is a, a degree of malice in, in envy, so it differs from jealousy a little bit. Uh, drunkenness uh, and revelings kind of belong together. Let's just pause. Th there's a whole list there. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings. That's eight things in a row that all will spoil the relationships that you have. Why do relationships break down? Why do, do, do uh, things happen where people fracture and fall out with one another? Well, because of the works of the flesh. And it isn't the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit brings people together. The Lord Jesus Christ who gifted that spirit prayed to the Father and says, Father, I pray that they might be one as we are one. And you can't get closer than that. The bond of Father and Son and Holy Spirit. One in three and three in one. You see, the Spirit brings people together. The Spirit heals, forgives, loves. The Spirit brings about love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and so on as we, we can go on and see another time but but not the flesh the flesh always ruins things and it ruins relationships and it stirs up the passions within and then the last two belong together as well uh, a kind of couplet a family of sins drunkenness and revelings some modern translations translate revelings uh, orgies, but it just literally means wild parties. Any kind of wild parties. It can involve promiscuity, but as it does today. Drunkenness and revelings. And w what inspires people to uh, live for a Friday night? To live for a Saturday? Going into some seedy place at the small hours of the morning with music that would give uh, anyone a headache, uh, pumping away, and they drink and drink and drink, not because they're thirsty, but to get drunk, to forget about all things, to lose all inhibitions, uh, to uh, uh, be taken over and consumed by alcohol, and in order to have a, a promiscuous uh, and what they consider uh, enjoyable time. And then come the hangover on the Monday morning, they're filled with the deepest of regret, only to live for another Friday night and do it all over again. Where does that come from? The Holy Spirit? No. It comes from the flesh. These are the works of the flesh. Now, I tried to go through the list as quickly as I could, not, not because it's not to take it seriously, 
Well, because there's 17 things, and well, if I took five minutes on each one, we'd be here a long time. So that's the list. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think God, of all the many wonderful things that he has revealed and could be revealed in his word, why do you think God would inspire Paul to write down such a list? Well, I think the first reason I would give is so that we might all know what potential we have for sin. There's a potential in us. Now, I dare say, through that list, you could tick off or cross off things, and you say, oh, I haven't done that. But here's a fact for you. There is not a person in this building who, in all honesty before God, could say, I haven't done any of those things. I've never been guilty of anything like that. Anything remotely like that. Remember that he ends the list, and such like. So don't excuse yourself if you think, well, he didn't specifically identify my sin. And such like. And that kind of thing. That's the, the primary reason, I think, that we might all understand what the potential is within all of us. And that we might see that all of us have a propensity in our natural state towards sinfulness. Also, I think a list like this indicates to us how perfect the knowledge of God is. It's not just that we might know what lies within us, but how perfect God's knowledge is. Because he doesn't just say sin general and then start specifying the fruits of the spirit but God takes knowledge of all men at all times observing all things he is a perfect God the Bible reveals who has perfect knowledge the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good and the Lord sees the revelings and he sees the adulterers and he sees uh, the, the those who hate or those who are jealous or filled with bitterness or envy, those who cause and bring about strife. He sees those things in our lives, in the world, in in, in a specific way, and itemizes them all. Our God's knowledge of, of our lives, of every detail of our lives, comes to the fore when we have a list. It's itemized. You say, well, that's not a very nice list. Well, I didn't inspire Paul to write this list. God did. And we have to ask ourselves, well, why? And I think that's a reason. That we might see how perfect God's knowledge is. But you know, I think the chief reason is that we might realize, in the context here, that we might realize how much joy we might have if we would walk in the Spirit. That's the reason in this context. You see where the flesh leads. You see what misery it brings. How it always breaks things and always spoils things. The old saying is, sin always ruins things. It always does. It brings about misery and destruction and broken heartedness and illness and uh, failed marriages and all kinds of heartache and grief and sorrow. Why? Because People are living governed by their flesh and living after the carnal desires that arise out of that. So we have what we might call a striking list. It's likely that we're all innocent of perhaps some things on this list, but none of us are innocent of all things. The second thing that I want you to observe comes down at the end of this list, is a repeated plea. He says, (coughs) excuse me, in verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and so on, of which, uh, and such like, of, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past. I tell you before, as I have told you in time past. I'm gonna warn you again, and I've already warned you. I think that's significant. He doesn't just give this list and leave it to people's remembrance. 
that they might think to themselves, well, yeah, well, I've heard all this before. He underlines the fact that he said it before, and he underlines the fact that he is intentional, therefore. He hasn't forgotten that he said it before, and he's just repeating himself. We might do that, but he's making it clear he hasn't done that. You ever meet those people and they, they start to tell you a story and you've heard this story before but you don't like to interrupt them but there's a little break so yeah you told me this but do you know what they want to still carry on and tell you it don't they? They want to still finish what they started. We've all met those people and we can all forget what we've said before. All of us. We don't like to we can't remember forgetting, but we forget. But you see, the Apostle Paul is underlining the fact, I've said this to you before, and I'm going to say this to you again. Why? We ask the question, well, why, why is there this list? Well, why is the Apostle Paul repeating himself? I think the first reason is because we are so slow to learn. We are so so slow to learn the lessons even of our own past and how readily, how quickly, how easily we can all slip back in to the old ways, slip into the old nature, the old habits, the bad habits and how uh, quickly we can all, all, every one of us, we can backslide, we can turn away from what is good. We can turn to what is evil because it appeals to gratify, it appears to satisfy hungers and longings within and to be led by the flesh. How readily we all can sin. Hebrews chapter 12 says, the sin that easily besets you. Easily. It's just like that in an instant. And so we need to be repeatedly warned, repeatedly called to by a gracious God. And also, because God is patient, he never, ever punishes after calling once or twice. But he calls again and he calls again. And he calls again. And he calls again. And he calls again. He is exceedingly long-suffering. The Lord has spoken to you, perhaps, in the past. And he has challenged you. And he has convicted you. Now, when you went out, perhaps you had new impulses fresh desires that were wakened up in the spirit to overcome, to do what is good and right, to pray, to turn to the Lord. But how quickly the devil can come and attack you and how quickly temptation can take over and how quickly those lusts of the flesh and the appetites and enjoyment and pleasures uh, can allure you to want to gratify them and satisfy them again. That's, that's how the devil works. There is the evil spirit and there is the Holy Spirit. And, and the Lord is calling and he's calling and he's very long-suffering and he's very patient and even though we've heard before, he tells us again. And we see it again and again in Israel's history. And we see how he spoke to them and he challenged them. And, and they knew what was right. And they didn't want to hear it. So they stoned the prophets. But what did God do? Send fire from heaven to destroy them? The disciples who uh, witnessed a town rejecting Jesus turned to him and said, Do you want us to call down fire from heaven? And he silenced them. He hadn't come for that. You don't know what you're saying. Patiently, our God deals with men. Patiently, as a father pities his child. Patiently. Do 
So the Lord repeats himself in your life and in mine because we're slow to learn. So we have a repeated plea. But then he goes on, so we have a striking list and a repeated plea. And at the end of this verse, in verse 21, he says, Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Here we have a tragic end. He is warning us that such things lead to destruction. Such a way of life leads to eternal judgment. And it does not lead you up to God. It does not lead you into heaven. It does not lead you into the presence of the company of the angels and all of the redeemed. It will not lead you to a tearless, joyful, happy morning. It will not lead you to when every tear is wiped and every blessing is enjoyed and received, when there's a new heaven and a new earth. It will not lead you to be delivered from sin finally, to have a new body that isn't wearing out and rusting out and, and full of aches and pains. It will not lead you there. All these works of the flesh lead you down to the pit. That's where they lead you. The spirit leads heavenward. And the flesh leads hellward, if that's a, a word. Leads you down. And the spirit leads you up. And yet, so many halt between their two opinions. The Apostle Paul once came to King Agrippa. And he preached a sermon to him. He had appealed to Caesar. They'd accused him of things he hadn't been guilty of and they were going to put him to death. So he said, well, I'm a Roman citizen. I appealed to Caesar. And they couldn't deny that, so off he was sent. And on the way there, he had to appear before a man called King Agrippa. And he preached a sermon to him and he said to him, Paul, almost you persuade me to become a Christian. And he said, would to God that you weren't almost persuaded. And it's all very well. You can hear a list and you can receive a list and you can say, well, yeah, God is patient. And I see all these things. And I see where they lead. But do nothing about it. Almost is not quite. Have you been almost persuaded to become a Christian? Almost persuaded. There's an old hymn. It goes like this. Almost persuaded now to believe almost persuaded Christ to receive seems now some soul to say go spirit go thy way some more convenient day on thee I'll call almost persuaded come come today almost persuaded turn not away Jesus invites you here angels are lingering near prayers rise from hearts so dear oh wanderer come Almost persuaded, harvest is past. Almost persuaded, doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad that bitter wail. Almost, but lost. I tell you before, as I've told you, I'm telling you again. They that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God.